Welcome to this rapid revision lesson looking at what was the Renaissance. This is intended to serve as a brief introduction to the Renaissance period, particularly when it comes to medicine. So when was the Renaissance? Well, here's a very basic timeline to give you a bit of an idea, going from the Middle Ages with 1200 right the way through to 1800. So let's get our bearings. We've already probably studied the medieval period, and the Black Death happened in 1348, or at least that's when it arrived in England. Then we've got the Tudor period in English history, between 1485 with Henry VII and 1603 with the death of Elizabeth I. The English Civil War takes place between 1642 and 1649, or at least the first one does. So where do we divide the line? Well, roughly speaking, it's about here. So the Middle Ages, for our purposes, goes from about 1200 right the way up until about 1450 to 1500, although it really isn't an exact science. It's not as if people want to, uh, went to bed one December the 31st and then woke up the next day and thought, well, it's a renaissance now, let's start researching things. They really didn't. So when we say circa 1450 to 1700, it really isn't as precise as that. And you could just as easily say around 1500 to 1700 too. The word renaissance means the rebirth of learning inquiry and therefore it should represent progress. Indeed, there were crucial breakthroughs in the renaissance in the fields of art, science, technology, and indeed religion. This should lead to massive progress, surely, particularly in terms of medicine. Well, the best answer I can give you there is partly. The thing is, by 1700, people were basically no healthier than they had been in the Middle Ages. But that said, people knew a lot more than they did before, and that provided a foundation for later medical progress. And part of that is down to things like the printing press which we'll come on to. Our first factor for progress is art. If you've watched my previous video on medieval progress, you could always use this as an opportunity to create some revision cards. Here we've got our first source. This is a medieval depiction of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. Yes, that is supposed to look like a baby. It's got a bit of a receding hairline going on, which doesn't seem particularly babyish to me. Anyway, Let's have a look at source two by comparison. Although the scene itself isn't especially naturalistic with angels and an oversized clamshell, the depiction of the body is so much more realistic than it was before. Renaissance artists developed new paints and new techniques which allowed more accurate and realistic pictures to be created, especially using things like oil paints. As some countries turned away from Catholicism too, artists spent less time on religious art and more on natural and representative art, which was realistic. Some art forms could be printed too. And so if we compare these two paintings, regardless of what the subject matter is, the depiction of the human body in Source 2 is more accurate than it is in Source 1. It has more advanced colours and it has more accurate perspective too. So not only are the artist's ideas moving on, but this could lead to progress in terms of medicine too. We'll have a look at that link in a moment. Here's another famous example of Renaissance art. Well, so far we'd only really looked at painting, but this is Michelangelo's David, and there is a close-up of it. Here's what Michelangelo, the sculptor, said himself. The sculpture is already complete within the marble block. Before I start my work, it is already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. Well, what is he really talking about there? It's an incredible work of art. The perspective is incredible, and also the realism too. Look at the hand, look at the blood vessels underneath the skin. It almost looks real, and yet it is carved out of a solid block of marble. This is only possible, not only with incredible skill, but with a really close observation of what the human body is really like. And that's where we have our link with medicine. There's a greater inquiry as to realism, a great, greater knowledge, therefore, of the body's anatomy, and that is only going to help medical progress. This is particularly true of someone called Andreas Vesalius, who we'll look at in a future video. Factor two is science. The Renaissance was a time of great discovery. Galileo used telescopes to learn about the planets and to help prove the Earth orbits the sun and not the other way around. I'll just point out that the whole working out the, the Earth as a globe thing had been worked out some time before. Another famous name is Leonardo da Vinci. He was not only an amazing artist, but he came up with many new and modern ideas, even if he had no way of building them. These included things like the tank and the helicopter pictured. 
Science now used experiments and records to prove new ideas. This started a trend of questioning and challenging old ideas, which had previously been accepted without question. So would this be the end of Hippocrates and Galen's hold on medical understanding? Well, in truth, not quite. But what it would do is provide the opportunity to prove what they had got right and also challenge what they had got wrong. More on that in future videos. Our third factor is technology. In particular, the printing press. This is one of the greatest breakthroughs in all of human communication. The Renaissance saw the invention of the printing press. This allowed books to be made more quickly, accurately and cheaply than ever before. Even pictures could be engraved and printed, like the one we see below. Printing also took book reproduction away from the church, allowing books to contain newer ideas and making books more widely available to more people and indeed in more languages. So the printing press has tremendous importance in general, but also in terms of sharing medical knowledge. That's not the only thing about technology though. The diagram here shows a mechanical pump. These were new technology at the time, but they didn't just stop there. This provided an inspiration for some other ideas too. Other developments had an impact, albeit indirectly. Water pumps have been developed, and this might have contributed to later ideas about the circulation of the blood. In particular, you'd need to look at William Harvey for this, which I'll do a video on later. This is an accurate reproduction of a dissected heart. You can see the different chambers and the way that it works like a pump. This had been suggested before, but instead William Harvey was able to demonstrate how the blood circulates in one direction, that blood must be carried through invisible capillaries, and that it is reused or recirculated, unlike Galen's idea that the blood was used up like a fuel in the body. And so mechanical pumps like the one pictured possibly served as an inspiration for people like William Harvey. And then we've got our fourth and final factor, religion. Religion in the Middle Ages had been a major part of why so little progress happened. As in the Middle Ages, the church controlled knowledge, but this meant that some new ideas were stopped and it held medicine back. But new religious ideas were challenging this control. Protestants were bringing new ideas about religion. As people were more likely to challenge religious traditions, attitudes were more likely to challenge other traditions too, including medical beliefs. Now, that's not to get into the, uh, an argument between Protestantism and Catholicism, because let's not forget that the Catholic Church had actually been a great steward of knowledge as well, and was one of the big reasons why so many old ideas had actually survived at all. But Protestantism was a new way of looking at things, and if people were prepared to look at religion in a new way, they were often prepared to look at other things in a new way too. So religion is really intertwined with attitudes. From the 1400s onwards, the church no longer banned or discouraged human dissections, allowing people to learn more about the body, and, indeed, that Galen got some things wrong. More on that in future videos too. But for now, in summary, our final points. How much change or continuity was there in medieval medicine as related to our four factors today? Well, art is an example of progress. New realistic and secular, as in non-religious, art forms allowed more realistic diagrams of the human body, like the example produced in the work of Van Andreas Vesalius we can see on this page. Then we've got science. This also represents progress. There was a move towards greater scientific inquiry and a willingness to challenge old ideas. Technology also led to progress. The printing press introduced cheaper, more accurate and more widely available books to share discoveries. And religion also saw some progress. Religion remained very important, but the Protestant Reformation was challenging the old structures and ideas, and shows a sign that attitudes were changing too. So let's have a look at our, our uh, continuum here. Where would you place your mark? For the Renaissance, would it be a question of continuity or change? Well, really, we're looking at more examples of change here, although things are staying the same in some respects, particularly when it comes to how healthy people were. Where would you place your mark on this scale? That's all for this video though, I hope it's been helpful to you, and like I say, like our previous video on medieval change, you could also use this as a framework for creating some, some of your own revision notes. But for now, that's the end of the video, I'll say thanks very much for watching, and I hope it's been helpful. If it has, please like the video, and you can subscribe to the channel for even more. On that note, I'll say good health and goodbye.